Yeah, my phone is gone. Yep, you're online. We're live there. So, um, what was our buddy Dino trying to say? Huh? What was our buddy Dino trying to say? In what way? I thought it sounded fine. Oh no, um, we've got nothing coming out of the main speakers. We've only got um, stage. Like, we've got no control of turning this, like, for the main house, like, right up to the top, making no difference for the For a dream? Good question. Back there somewhere, Harry set him up last week, and changed everything last week. Last week? And then left. I love him too. <laughs> you get to do it. It's cool. It'll all work out. We'll make it work. I was wondering what that was all about. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well done, sir. What's that? Oh, that's the, I'll tell you what that is. That's the music for the countdown, I will guarantee it. I'm gonna get a little banner, okay? I'll, I'll get a little banner. Go Tim, go Tim, go Tim. Glenn, Glenn, come here, come here. Remember when you were really little and I said when everything goes wrong, just smile and wave? You remember when you were little and I first met you and I said when everything goes wrong and you don't care, just smile and wave, yeah? Smile and wave. Therefore, all of these are going to have to go a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. Let's get rid of those and go down a bit, and down a bit, and down a bit, and definitely down a bit. And balance forward is fine, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I do have control of it. We've got a Oh, there's the amp on the Which I don't know how to turn on. I turn on everything that I know how to turn on. I don't even know where the app switch is. So it must be something that Larry turns on. Yeah, every morning before I get here. But Larry gets here like 6 in the morning. But he's here at 6, 5.36 in the morning every day. And works until 3, 4, every day. Probably works harder than anybody in the church. Uh, him and Michelle. Oh yeah, and all those every day. Michelle. Okay, we're going live 
soon, yeah. Say to the king, say to the king, who is God. 
I'll be honest with you. Um, let me just say it. Fifteen minutes before we started the service, uh, the band we were still trying to figure stuff out. Oh, it was on that. And we're going to keep talking about Jesus um, and his life, but I have some good news and bad news. Um, the good news first, we're starting a new series today called Life Well Lived, and it's going to keep us in the life of Jesus till summer. Now, you may not recall that a long time ago, three years ago or so, we were starting this building campaign, and we were raising money, and it was like this big deal. And I prayed a lot about what to do for our church in that um, because I, I've been a part of church for 22 years on staff. I've been a part of three building campaigns, and I've seen what happens when the church gets a new building or gets a renovation. We all get so fixated. It's cool to see um, what we love as a place uh, evolve and, and become beautiful and, and more functional. Um, but we start thinking and believing that our building is going to be what saves us. Dr. Trump, you've been through this before yourself, um, but there's only one Savior, and that kind of hit my heart real hard. I said, we need to focus on Jesus. As we go through this building project, let's ground ourselves in Jesus. So I started studying a couple summers, or three summers, four summers ago. I started studying the life of Jesus, like in depth, to put together a few sermon series. And what ended up happening is I got three years of material all organized in like sub-groups, sub-kind of series, and um, so the, the good news is we're going to talk about Jesus until summer. The bad news is I'm out of topics. <laughs> After some, I mean, I'm not out of things to say, don't get me wrong, I'm just the end of my Jesus studies are, are done that started three years ago, which I think is going to be cool to kind of culminate our journey and reflect on what God has done in our life. And I'm excited for that during the series. But um, we, we need to adopt his behaviors and his teachings, his patterns for our life. That's what we are, are doing here when we walk in these doors. We say, I want to lead a life well lived. Well, what does that even mean? It means that we adopt the teachings of Jesus and apply those truths to our lives and we follow his patterns. So today we're going to look at the baptism of Jesus in the Gospel of John, but I'll touch on all the Gospels, and we're going to look into the ministry of John the Baptist, and we're going to see how John's ministry and Jesus' ministry kind of intersect for us. Now, I'm approaching this event with a question I've been asked so many times, and I've asked myself, why did Jesus get baptized anyway? And that's what we're going to uh, look at today. So let's see what unfolds as we get to the first chapter of John. We're going to be in verses 23 to 34. If you have a Bible with you, otherwise... Why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. The straps of his sandals I am not worthy to un said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself 
myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to be baptized with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Amen. Let's get the first bit of truth out of the way. Um, of the four gospel accounts that talk about the baptism of Jesus, I pick the one where Jesus doesn't actually get baptized. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it says that Jesus went down into the water and came up out of the water. He went to get baptized. Um, it's implied in John. John is doing something different. He's bearing witness to what he has seen as confirmation of the presence of the Messiah. And as John saw the Spirit come down upon Jesus in the baptism, it was this messianic sign that God had given him. If God told John, you're going to see this happen, and then that's the event, that's the event of Jesus being baptized. But in John, we don't actually see Jesus get dumped in the water. Now, I'm sure he got fully immersed and all that kind of stuff. Whatever, you know, it doesn't really matter what happened. The truth is, the focus is on the opening of heaven, the Holy Spirit coming down upon Jesus, signifying him as God's chosen one. Today, again, I'm going to focus on this major question, why did Jesus need to be baptized anyway? And it's a logical question, because he is the Son of God. Let's just let that hang for a second. Why does the Son of God need to be baptized? I mean, there could have been many different ways he was anointed as the Messiah. With that said, there are many different ways that he could have been born. Instead of the whole, like, mother for nine months carrying him around, riding around on donkeys, being born in a stable, all that kind of, you know, like, Literally, God could have just said, it's time for the Son, and sat, there he is, 30 years old, ready to come out of the ministry. Instead, we have this development process of his human life, and I think the same principle applies with baptism. It could have been done differently, but this was the way God chose and why. And let's keep in mind for a second that the question we're asking today is the same question John the Baptist asks in Matthew's Gospel. He says, wait, Messiah, why am I baptizing you? You should be the one baptizing me. And that's a great point. John the Baptist was providing a baptism for the repentance of sins. What sins did Jesus commit that needed him to repent and be cleansed of? There were many. He was perfect after all. But Jesus says to John, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So there's the answer to your question. Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And I'm done preaching for today. I mean, what does that even mean, to fulfill all righteousness? Um, let's dig into some possibilities. I've got four that I want to discuss with you. Uh, four possibilities as to why Jesus was baptized. Um, and theologians and scholars have been wrestling with this forever, okay? With this very question. But the first possibility is this. Jesus had to be baptized in order to fully identify with his followers, with those he came to save. When John the Baptist hits the scene doing his ministry, there's people from everywhere coming to hear him preach, and prophesy, and they want to be baptized for the repentance of the sin. It's, it's like unprecedented at this time, which is why John has so much attention. If you recall, um, John eventually gets his uh, head shot, you know. Um, but, okay, that's how much attention he was drawing, and he executed him at a different point of his life. John's ministry was unprecedented. And Jesus knew that because Jesus knew that because John's ministry was the setup of his own ministry, this, this baptism and repentance thing, he had to publicly identify with those he was coming to save. He had to become like the people he was coming to save. John's baptism was one of turning away from sin 
and turning to God. That's what repentance is. It's turning away from something not good, turning to something that is righteous and holy. And I think Jesus wanted to identify with that path, even though he didn't have to. Because he didn't have any sin to repent from. He was still pointing his life away from sin. He didn't have to do that like you turn thing, but he wanted to leave sin in the background and push towards a righteous and holy life. He needed to model that for the people so he could teach them what that would look like. So the first possibility is that he, had, he got that time to identify with people. The second possibility is that Jesus was baptized in order to signify the moment his ministry began. You've got to remember that for 30 years, Jesus walked around the earth as a manual laborer. 30 years. It's like two blends. Okay? 30 years. Anybody in here even close to 30 anymore? Paul, you raised your hand down. Yeah. Sorry, that ship sailed a while ago for you, pal. But in those first 30 years, he wasn't ready, he wasn't called, what have you, to the ministry life. So there had to be a really clear marker for when that transition was going to begin. And from John's perspective, John the Baptist, that is, he's just a place for it. He's just kind of holding down the fort until the real deal begins. So John has this idea, and he says it in his preaching all the time, like, I'm just here to prepare the way. It's like John's got a baton to hand off to Jesus, and that's when the real stuff is going to begin. And what better place for this to occur than in the Jordan River, where John, for some time, had been telling people, turn away from sin, dive into these waters and let them wash over you, start over, start a new life, turn towards God. Not only that, put yourself in the shoes of the Jewish people for a little bit. The Jordan is like a major location in their history. The Jordan is where they cross miraculously into the promised land. They turn from a life in slavery and wandering in the wilderness into the land of God's promise through the Jordan. This miraculous event signifies new life for the Israelites, new life for the people of God. Not to mention a ton of other biblical events that happen on the Jordan. So it's possible that the baptism itself with the added layer of the Jordan River as the backdrop served as kind of a line of demarcation for Jesus' old life and Jesus' new life. His old life as a laborer, his new life in ministry, as well as our old life and our new life. And then by Jesus inserting himself into that narrative, Jesus now becomes the new line of demarcation between the old life and the new life. That's really important because what is life without Jesus? The third possibility is that Jesus was baptized in order to be ceremonially cleansed before the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now, in order to better understand this, we have to go back to the Old Testament once again. The Old Testament had a temple, and this was like the home of God, and the temple had a lot of layers, and in the innermost chamber of the temple was a place called the Holiest of Holies, and that's where the very presence of God was located. And only one person, the very most high priest, was allowed to go in there and be in the presence of God. Now, before the very high priest did anything involving the Holy Spirit, he would have to go through a ceremony. It didn't matter if he had been sitting there all day, didn't sit for a second, he had to go through a ceremonial cleansing, a purification ritual that allowed him to be in the presence of God's Spirit. So, in this case, heaven is about to open above the Jordan River. Like the fabric of heaven is about to open up, and the Holy Spirit is going to come down on Jesus in a bodily form like a dove, and it's going to land on Jesus, and that will become the indwelling of God that prompts 
Jesus' ministry. But in order for the Spirit to fully be able to fill him up, he had to go through that ceremonial cleansing first. So the possibility exists that Jesus, as our, as our new high priest, is simply following Old Testament law. So I'm giving you three possibilities, um, and there's a fourth one that I love. And this is kind of where I want to land and wrap things today. Um, they're all good possibilities I've given you so far. They're all plausible. They can't be denied. Uh, but the fourth possibility um, requires us to dig a bit deeper, actually, into Luke's gospel and the Luke's telling of the baptism story. Um, all four gospel writers say that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. But only Luke tells us what Jesus was doing at the moment that happened. Jesus was praying. And prayer is about connecting with God and, and, and letting your walls come down and, and being open to what God has to say to you. And he was opening his heart by the Lord. Plain and simple. Um, Luke 3, 21 says, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, the Holy Spirit came down. So maybe, just maybe, Jesus was baptized to show us what the holy life is all about. It's about opening ourselves up to God. Without walls, opening our hearts and minds, and allowing God to penetrate whatever is going on. And while my kids rush the baby out of the room, I'm going to get the focus back on me. Because this is literally the crux of what I want to say. You come away with nothing else. I'm serious. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I would have mess this morning before you showed up. Maggie, Tim, and Gwen are all nodding their heads. I couldn't get the worship together. I was a mess. And at a certain point, whatever's going on in our lives, we have to choose to open ourselves up to God. And you know what God tells us in those moments? To rest in Him. Actually, Tim said it, and Maggie reiterated it. We just need these songs to rest in Jesus. When Jesus opened Himself up as He prayed, He just rested in the Lord. He let all the walls come crashing down. Anything that had happened in his life, any, anybody who had stiffed him on a payment for carpentry work, any, anybody who wasn't going to listen to him, anything in his life that could have been a distraction from God, he opened himself up to the Lord fully, and then the Holy Spirit penetrated his life and changed everything. And too often, we're hard-hearted. And I'm speaking to myself if I'm not speaking to you. Too often, we're hard-hearted. We like to do things our own way. We like to follow our own paths. And, and we put up walls and boundaries all the time around our own paths so that our way gets protected. And then we ask God to fit into our picture. But that is not how it works. See, the Lord is more than willing to meet us halfway. But we have to open ourselves up to that possibility, open ourselves up to that reality. We have to want to be connected. Like the vine and the branches motif we've talked about so often. We wither if we're doing it on our own. It is to be connected to Christ that we thrive and grow in our faith. So this week, even as we worship today, um, I want you to be thinking about those walls. Whatever whatever you're doing in your life that keeps the Lord in a distance. Think about the ways you tend to do it on your own. Think about the ways you close yourself off to God and remember this picture of Jesus in that moment of being baptized, on his knees praying, opening himself up and the Spirit penetrating his life and changing everything for him and everything for us. I mean, even Jesus let his guard down to let God in. He did to show us how we ought to live. So if you want to experience life well lived, life like Jesus lived it, just remember as we worship, we can't do it on our own. We cannot 
do it on our own. Amen. I'm going to walk on up here and get the band uh, ready, but can you close your eyes and think about the things we talked about this morning and see what resonates with you?